was braucht es, um agil zu sein? Wir müssen sprechen können, reden können, das ist allen klar. Wir müssen sehen können, vorausschauen können, auch sehr wichtig. Aber wir müssen eben auch hören, wir müssen zuhören können. Und genau das geht in der heutigen Zeit, wo alles viel schneller wird, wo der Lärm immer größer wird, zunehmend verloren. Das sagt Julian Treasure. Er nennt sich selber den Master of Sound. Und er berät unter anderem Spitzenmanager, dass sie eben ihr Gehör wieder ein bisschen mehr schärfen sollen, dass sie wieder besser lernen sollen, zuzuhören. Nicht diesen Sinn zu vergessen. In diesem Sinne wünsche ich Ihnen jetzt, dass Sie sich zurücklehnen können und für einmal einfach gut zuhören können. Welcome to the CEF 2016. Julian Treasure, we're all ears. Listen. That is the wonderful sound of more than a thousand people consciously listening. It's also the sound of good business, good management, and good government, as I hope I'll show you in the next 25 minutes or so. Just think, politicians go around the world having talks, don't they? I often think we'd be far better off if they went around the world having listens instead. <laughs> Might improve things. If you want to be as agile as this little guy here. Yes, you absolutely need flexibility, you need strength, you need speed, and all these things are crucial for organizations as well. There's one more thing you need, awareness. Now this little guy is getting most of his awareness through his ears. Animals do. Awareness of opportunity, food. Awareness of danger, predators. And just as they get that through their ears, I hope I'm going to be able to show you that so can you, as individuals, as managers, and also as organizations. Now, in our world, the eyes tend to have it. We design for the eyes. We think about the eyes all the time. Yes, we take in most of our information through our eyes, and we tend to forget, therefore, about these things. The ears are amazing. Vision is a cone. Hearing is a sphere. You can hear what's behind you. I don't know about you, but I'm not very good at seeing what's behind you. You hear, if you have perfect hearing, 10 octaves. Did you know that the visible light spectrum is just one octave? Hearing is your primary warning sense. We've grown up with this over hundreds of thousands of years. And that's why it's far easier to upset people through their ears and through their eyes. We start right back at the beginning. This is the first sound you ever heard. Before you even had ears, you were listening to this with every cell in your body. You're still listening that way now. It's just we're used to thinking that we hear only with our ears. And yet, most of the sound around us is not present at all. We stand on street corners shouting over noise like this, and many people are having their sleep disrupted night after night by traffic noise way above the World Health Organization recommended maximum. Now, 2% may not sound very serious until you realize that's actually 8 million people in Western Europe alone who are having their sleep disrupted night after night. The WHO now says that noise pollution is second only to air pollution in the number of years of healthy living lost every year in Europe. And that kind of bad sound is so prevalent, we get into the habit of suppressing our consciousness of sound. When's the last time you thought about sound? We, most of us have a relationship with sound that's a little bit like this, actually. We don't think about it. And yet, sound affects you all in four very powerful ways. I'm just going to share those four with you very quickly before we start talking about listening. Here's the first. Now, that's a little shot of cortisol, very appropriate for first thing in the morning. If your alarm clock at home sounds like that, please change it. <laughs> Not good for you to wake up to a sound like that. It accelerates your heart rate, your breathing, fatty acids enter your blood. There are all sorts of physiological responses to particularly sudden sounds. Now, I could calm you down again. This is surf, roughly 12 cycles a minute. 
very similar to the breathing of a sleeping human being, and a great sound to use if you have problems sleeping. I do commend it to you, but I'm not going to leave it on very long now, for obvious reasons. <laughs> the second way sound affects us is physiologically. It changes our emotions, our feelings. We all know that music can do this. This piece of music isn't going to make you feel happy. It wasn't designed to make you feel happy. It's a sad piece of music. It's not the only kind of sound that can change our emotions, though. In my company, the Sound Agency, we use birdsong a great deal in offices, in other places, because birdsong makes most people feel very safe and secure at a deep level. We've learned over hundreds of thousands of years that when the birds are singing, things are okay, generally. It's only if something bad is going to happen, the birds suddenly stop. Hmm, that's not a good moment, is it? The third way sound affects us is cognitively. You can't understand two people talking at the same time, or in this case, one person talking twice. It's not possible. We have bandwidth for roughly 1.6 human conversations. So for people who have to work in an office that sounds like this, particularly if you can hear one conversation next to you, it's extremely disturbing. We have no ear lids, you can't shut it out, and you are programmed to decode language. The effect on productivity. Now, I'm not saying open plan is always bad. It's good for one kind of working, and that is collaboration. Collaborative working is great in open plan offices. Open plan, however, is not good for concentration, for contemplation, decompressing, thinking great, strategic thoughts, or indeed, very often for communication, simply because you're putting off everybody else in a space. There's a new system which is called activity-based workspaces, which is all about designing different kinds of workspace for these different types of working. Please don't assume open plan is one size fits all. The fourth way sound affects us is behaviorally. Our behavior changes. So is this person going to drive at a steady 35 kilometers per hour? Perhaps not. This kind of sound changes our physical behavior. At the simplest level, we will move away from unpleasant sound if we can. So if I were to put this on and leave it on for the next 20 minutes, I think most of you would probably leave the hall. Of course you would. And we've already seen that this kind of noise, if you can't get away from it, has devastating effects. Billions and billions of euros a year in treating people who have stress, depression, and other physiological effects of noise. Now, we work a lot with retailers, and they're just now starting to understand that that kind of effect has a huge effect on them. If a shop sounds bad, we leave, and we spend less money. So we need to think about designing environments. Those of you who are retailers probably want to pay attention to that. Designing with our ears and not just with our eyes. So let's talk about listening. I love this quote from Ernest Hemingway. I agree with it. I think those who can listen well have a huge advantage in business, because the business landscape has changed. The old business landscape is on the left of this chart. We have moved to the right. It's not a, a forecast. We're now in the right-hand side of this. It's no longer enough to sell stuff, to broadcast, to treat people as consumers. I always think of a consumer as a mouth and a wallet. It's a very demeaning way to talk about people. We now are in a conversation, and if you're in a conversation, you need to listen, don't you? Problem, we don't. Here are the four communication channels that we use. Reading, writing, speaking, and listening. To send, to receive, two for the ears, two for the eyes. Now, I've presented them here with equal weight, but that is not the way we treat them in society or indeed in our educational system, is it? It's a lot more like this. It would be a scandal, wouldn't it, if a child left school unable to read or write. There would be questions in Parliament. Children leave school every year, untaught and untested in their speaking skills, and even more so in their listening skills. Listening is a skill, but it's a silent skill. We don't teach it, we don't test it, we just assume we're all going to pick it up as we go along. I'd like to show you there's a bit more to it than that. Let me define listening, first of all. My definition of listening, and there are many, my definition is making meaning from sound. Now, you hear everything, you listen to certain parts, and you make it mean something. The first very important thing to understand about listening 
is that your listening is unique. Every single person in this auditorium has a, a listening that is as unique as your fingerprints, your voice print, or your irises. Why? Because we listen through a set of filters. And these filters are determining what we pay attention to and how we make meaning from it. We're born into a culture, we speak a language. These things immediately determine our listening. And along the way, we accrete values, attitudes, beliefs from parents, from role models, uh, from people that we respect, teachers perhaps. And in any situation, we go into a situation with some assumptions about the way the world is, some expectations about what we're going to get, some intentions maybe, and of course, there are emotions too. Have you ever noticed that it's harder to listen when you're upset? Or the other way around, the more you listen, the less upset somebody gets. So listening and emotions can be inverse. Together, these things actually create your reality. And the exciting thing is that if you start to become conscious about your filters, you can start to actively engage in creating your reality. It's not just something that happens to you. What do you pay attention to? Now, unfortunately, I think in the modern world, we're losing our listening. Not just because there's noise all around us, yes, that's important, but also because we've invented ways of recording. Once upon a time, all human knowledge was passed down orally. You sat at the feet of your master, and if you missed it, you missed it. Now that's not the case. You know, if you go to sleep now, probably this will be on YouTube later. We, you know, we can get it later. The premium on careful listening is no longer there. And we're impatient, aren't we? I love this cartoon. It's so true, isn't it? Oratory, rhetoric, these things have disappeared. I think the last time rhetoric was used in the UK in Parliament was about 1975. It's gone now, we have sound bites, we have attack journalism. Politicians get 20 seconds to put their whole view forward before they get interrupted and attacked. And then we have dumbing down of language. These are some of the words that the popular press in the UK use a great deal. And I'm interested that in the UK you can either be okay or furious now. There's not much in between that. If somebody's upset, it's always such and such fury at. Now, when we polarize and dumb down language like that, we lose subtlety and the quiet, still voice in the middle. Then we have the use of these things. Very, very prevalent. If you can hear this from somebody's headphones, they are killing their hearing. And that is happening a great deal. Did you know that one in six American teenagers is suffering from noise-induced hearing loss as a result of headphone abuse? We may be raising an entire deaf generation, and that, of course, will get worse as they get older. Also, there's a social effect of headphones. We turn big social spaces like this into millions of little sound bubbles. You only have to travel on public transport or indeed sit in an open plan office and see how many people are wearing headphones to create their own little bubble. Nobody's listening to anybody in that situation. Then we have the effect of technology. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever sent this text. I hope none of you have ever received this text. But it does get sent, and it does get received. This is not a conversation, is it? There's no listening in that. There are some habits, too, that we tend to evince as human beings, things that we like, which get in the way of our listening. And I'll just give you a couple of those uh, to look out for in business, particularly. Here's the first one. Now, we all like looking good, don't we? But it does tend to create very ineffective listening. Speech writing is what I call the process of, while there's this inconvenient noise in front of me, I'm thinking about the next brilliant thing I'm going to be saying. That's not actually listening. Competitive speaking, have you met people who do that? Oh, I'm going on holiday to Greece next year. Yeah, I know, I've been to Greece eight times. Oh. It's a bit of a joy kill, isn't it? That kind of competitive speaking, having to trump what somebody just said. And just the words, I know. I know, I know. Being unimpressed. If you know everything, what do you learn? Nothing. If there's one thing we like more than looking good, it's being right. Judging people, being superior, being justified. Having our opinions, which we many of us confuse with facts. I have to say opinions and facts, two different things. And if you conflate them, it can be pretty nasty. Interrupting, are there any interrupters in the audience here? One or two of you putting your hands up. Good, you're honest. The rest of you... Uh, have a little think about that. If you're an interrupter, here's a tip for you. 
Just practice taking a very deep breath before you talk. And you might find that during the course of taking that deep breath, you realize, oh, the other person is still talking. <laughs> Dogmatism, my way or the highway, and downright contempt for people, just dismissing people out of hand. These are not great business practices, they're not great listening practices, and they tend to really rob us of the richness of listening. And there are also some stumbling blocks that get in our way, and uh, there's a nice easy way to remember them with this mnemonic agents. Assumptions, I'll talk about those in a moment. Generalizations, taking a specific and generalizing it and then making meaning that way. Emotions get in the way, as I've said. Noise, often around us. Do you always think about the environment in which you're trying to have a conversation? Because the context can really damage the meaning that you're trying to put across. Time, we're busy, 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 busy. Listening takes time. Do you know it is actually impossible to listen to somebody properly and do anything else? Yeah, no, I am listening to you. That is not listening. Listening is paying attention and giving that person 100% of your emotion and your, your attention. And I believe there are billions of people on this planet who've actually never had the experience of being listened to properly. And then semantics, making different meanings out of the same words. And obviously, I mean, Switzerland is a country with three, four languages, I think, at least. <laughs> Uh, semantics must come into play a great deal in the way that we interpret words. I, talked to, I said I was going to mention assumptions a little bit. Here's the way it can play out, and it leads on to a very important general point. So the phrase, somebody says to somebody, let me help you. Here are two different people. The first person has an assumption about the world, which is people think I'm weak due to their history. The second person, people are nice, people are kind. So the first person interprets, let me help you, as an insult. I'm being patronized. And the emotional response is anger, resentment. No, I'm fine. Thank you very much. No. The other person, oh, that's nice. Somebody's helping you. Thank you so much. And the emotion is gratitude. Same input, two very different results because of the listening. And the general point that is so important is that you always speak into a listening. I'm doing that right now. So there are 1,300 people in this room. Every one of you has your individual listening, and together you create a gestalt group listening, and I'm speaking into it. It is so powerful in business and in life to ask yourself, what's the listening? What's the listening? Partly created by you, because the way I behave or any reputation that I carry before me will change the way you listen to me. That's true of you. If you're late for every meeting, people listen to you as late. Partly, it's brought by other people. So it's a kind of combination. It's important to take responsibility for the listening we create in our life. It's also important to ask the question, what is the listening? What is the listening? Get in the habit of asking that question, and your speaking will be so much more powerful, because every listening is not the same. So I want to give you three little exercises to improve your conscious listening skills. Here's the first. Silence. It's a rare sound, actually. Here you can get it in Switzerland. If you go above the tree line, there are no planes flying overhead. You get a beautiful big silence. Well, maybe you don't have to go that far. You could go and lock yourself in a bathroom or a small room. It's really good to get a few minutes of silence every day to recalibrate your ears and give you fresh listening power, because we tend to go dead to the noise, noise, noise that's coming in. Here's the second one. Listening positions. Now, I'm not talking about physical positions. This is a metaphor. If there's a house on a hill, and you don't like the way it looks, you can walk around the hill and see what it looks like from the other side. Well, to use that metaphor, we all tend to listen from one place. It's a bunker that we've created with those filters which we really aren't conscious of, and we're listening probably through a little slit in the bunker representing those filters, and we've forgotten there's a door in the back of it, and we can go out and move to a different place to listen from. Let me give you a couple of examples of this to start you off. You can create your own listening positions. Just the idea that you can listen from a different place is very powerful. So here's a scale from active this is used a lot in the therapeutic professions. It goes, what I heard you say is, 
and then you repeat exactly what the person said. Now, I wouldn't recommend you do that with your friends, because you wouldn't have friends for very long if that's all you do. <laughs> However, it's very powerful if you want to leave somebody feeling heard. Extremely powerful if you're talking to an angry teenager, by the way. So active listening. At the other end of that scale might be passive listening, more like a Zen master sitting by a stream, just hearing the sound, no interpretation going on at all. Here's another one. Critical listening, which is what you've been doing to me ever since I walked onto this stage. Oh, that's interesting. Didn't know that. Where did he get that? I don't agree with that. That little voice in your head, the one that's saying, what little voice is he talking about? That little voice, that's your editor, your critic. It's going all the time. This tends to be where we listen from in business, but we can get stuck there. And it's not always the most appropriate place to listen from. Very useful generally. But if somebody comes to you asking for time off for a bereavement, you don't want to be marking them out of 10 in how well they're doing this, really. You need to be going onto their island, feeling their feelings, and perhaps listening in an empathic way. Empathic listening leaves, feeling, leaves people feeling heard and understood. They say in relationships, there are three things we need to be heard, to be understood, and to be valued. This kind of listening does two of those. And one more, this is a, a bit of a gender stereotype I'll give you. With that proviso, I think there's enough truth in it to, uh, to ring with some of you. Men tend, now not all men, not all the time, but men tend to listen in a way I call reductive. That is for a point, to solve a problem, to achieve something, to reach a destination in the conversation. Male conversation they're having, I've got this problem, here's the solution. Oh, thanks. That's a male conversation. We're quite simple that way. <laughs> women, on the other hand, tend, not all women, not all the time, tend <laughs> to listen in a way that I call expansive. Now, in expansive listening, there is no point. It's not about reaching a destination. It's not about solving a problem. It's about being with the other person and enjoying the journey. It's a journey, not a destination. So look at these two eye to eye, heart to heart, just having a conversation. If we get these two confused, you have a conversation that goes something like this. She comes home and says, I've had a dreadful day. This happened, this happened, this happened. He says, he looks up from the football game he's watching. He says, have a bath, you'll feel much better. <laughs> now in the male world, that's problem solved, back to the football. In the female world, that wasn't quite what she was looking for, was it? She was looking for, you poor thing, sit down, have a glass of wine, tell me all about it. <laughs> you can get great, enormous improvements in relationship if you become conscious of these and not locked into listening from one place. So ask yourself, where am I listening from? The third little tool I want to give you is rasa, the Sanskrit word for juice, very powerful in conversation. Here it stands for receive, appreciate, summarize, ask. Receive, that is paying attention to somebody, looking at them, making eye contact when you're listening, or possibly leaning forward. You all know about body language. So not lolling backwards, not looking elsewhere, paying attention with everything that you've got. Appreciate the little noises like, oh, mm, oh, really? That oil conversation. I'm not very good at doing those. On the phone, people often say, are you still there? <laughs> I'm listening intently, but I've forgotten to make those little noises. They do help. Summarize, the word so, it's such a powerful word. You know, if you don't have a so person in the meeting, it can be a very long meeting. The so person will say, so, what we've all agreed is this, now we can put that aside and move on to that. If you don't have a so person, you can go round and round and round in circles. Very powerful word, summarizing. And then asking questions, of course, all the way through and at the end shows that you've been paying attention, rasa. I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it is incredibly important in your organizations to create a listening culture. Some of the most unpleasant organizations that I've ever had contact with have been the opposite of this. They've had a powerful, terrifying leader to whom people are so uh, respectful and of whom people are so frightened that they won't talk to them, they won't give them bad news in particular. Sometimes you need to hear bad news. Organizations that are more modern than that, companies like Google and so forth, have created a listening culture where they'll take an idea from somebody who's been in the company 24 hours and treat it seriously. There isn't a hierarchy 
of listening. Now, creating a listening culture takes commitment from the top. It takes communication because you have to show people that this is worthwhile. It's a thing, listening, we actually pay attention to. And it takes some accountability. Perhaps you put it into uh, people's reviews. 360 reviews can be very powerful if they include listening. And then it takes training. Who should you listen to? Well, here are some ideas. Along the top, the kind of people who will be, organized, uh, who'll be uh, involved in your organization, perhaps. They all have things to say. In the middle, mentors, experts. I mean, you're all here listening to experts. This is all good. You may have mentors, consultants, guides, people that you employ to give you external perspective. Most important of all, listen to yourself. You have experience. You have intuition. And you will also have a conscience. Everything you hear from everybody else needs to be filtered through those things. I mean, we all know that some of the most powerful organizations in the world have been, and effective organizations, have been effectively benevolent dictatorships. Think of Apple under Steve Jobs. Democracy and listening to everybody, particularly if you get obsessed with focus groups, can be pretty destructive in itself. So filter it through your own experience, intuition, and conscience. And what are you listening for? Food and danger opportunities, and threats in business. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be as agile as this little guy in the modern world, which I would suggest is a life or death matter, as it is for him, I do encourage you to do one thing, and that's listen. Thank you very much for lending me your ears today. Thank you. Julian Treasure, thank you very much. Uh, it was highly interesting. Yesterday here on this stage, um, the former Swiss national banker said the children should learn how to communicate. Children should learn how uh, to, learn, to learn IT in school. Mm. Uh, you just said children should learn to listen mm. early in school, not only to communicate, but to listen well. Uh, I just saw you this morning with your little daughter. <laughs> She's going to be a digital native all her life. <clears throat> Are you worried sometimes for her that, you know, that she might not listen enough anymore with all the buzz that's going around her all through her life, probably. You know, it's very interesting. Most of the communication protocols we've invented in the last 30 years are for the eyes. So we've got email, text, instant messaging. It's all screen-based. We use our eyes and our fingers all the time. That, ladies and gentlemen, is about to change. If you haven't seen what Viv is doing, which is the next generation from the people who invented Siri, Take a look at it. It's natural, it's, artifi it's artificial intelligence, and it's activated by voice. So I'm not worried about that because I think the way we will relate to the internet within the next two years, very, very soon, will largely be by speaking to it and listening to its responses to us, mm -hmm. not by using our fingers and our eyes the whole time. You're consulting a lot of, a lot of managers, and, and 10, 20 years ago, I can remember there was a, almost a boom that, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a manager, you have to take time and go away and maybe go to a monastery and maybe just have a, a, a week or two weeks of silence. Would you, would you advise that as well nowadays, or is that just you know, something from the past? Well, a week or two weeks would be a big luxury. And many people I know find silence intimidating. You know, we're so used to the, the noise of cities. Each city has its own voice, and we get very familiar with it. I know people who go to the country and feel intimidated by silence. I think it's very important to develop a relationship with silence. Whether or not that's two weeks, I think just a few minutes a day will help a great deal. Because it is the baseline. Silence is the context for all sound. In silence, you can hear yourself much more clearly, and your conscience too. So I think it's very important to get that relationship into your life. If you're surrounded by noise, you know we have a multi-channel world. I do worry about kids today who get bored if they haven't got at least three inputs going at the same time. That's just noise. And we don't listen to ourselves, we don't get the silence, we don't have that wonderful baseline from which we can listen freshly. Because silence makes us uncomfortable as well, which is, which is quite a sad thing, isn't it? It is a sad thing. And I hope people in Switzerland at least can get up a mountain. We don't have those in the UK. We, um, maybe I'll just go and lock myself in a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> You're from England. I, 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 was, I was watching a, a TV debate yesterday evening about the EU referendum that's coming up. Mm. Um, and it was really striking because nobody listened to the other. And uh, especially for politicians, especially for managers as well, maybe. I had the impression the one who listens always loses in the end because he doesn't get to speak. 
isn't that a, you know, a, a contradictory situation that nowadays everybody who, who tries to listen, as you say, will not get their points across? It is not the case in business, particularly if, if you're in a position of power and you can communicate this and create a culture of it. It is so powerful in business. In politics, I despair. I really do. In America and in the UK at the moment, we have big things going on, and the, the amount of listening is minuscule. You know, it's shouting that's going on. And uh, to be honest, I think listening is the sound of democracy as well as the sound of good business, because democracy depends on civilized disagreement. And that depends on understanding. Mm -hmm. And one thing I didn't say that I'd like you all to understand is I really believe that conscious listening always creates understanding. And understanding is critical for a world that's going to work. Mm -hmm. And in every personal relationship uh, as well. Another striking thing yesterday, there were, there were five women, one man, Boris Johnson, on stage. The women didn't listen either. Uh, we just heard you know, that, that old stereotype, that mm -hmm. old cliche. Obviously, we just saw it. Women listen longer to mm. each other or mm. to, to you. Tend to. They can learn not to in the The question world. is, let's break that cliche, do they listen better than men? Well, women's brains, it's now been shown, tend to work more side to side. Men's brains tend to work more front to back. In other words, in men, the two hemispheres are very, very separate. So we're not very good at multitasking. And that means if we're doing anything else, our listening goes out of the window. So men really have to concentrate on listening. Uh, women, probably much more possible to do a bit of brain surgery and listen at the same time because the brain is more connected. And that's, that's the research I've seen. All right. So listen, everybody here. Uh, it was a huge pleasure listening to you. Very interesting facts. And uh, I think we have something to think about today as well. Thank Excellent. you very much, Julian. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.